for your presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be standing here today. And had I been standing here 22 years ago, and you were telling me that I was going to be here today talking about the small children and the babies that were currently in our clinic, and that I'd be speaking to you today about them becoming parents themselves, I wouldn't have been able to believe that. Um, so today I'm here to tell you the story of these young people, especially the girls and young women in our clinic. Because as a result of the success of HEART, these perinatally young girls um, are now reaching adolescence and young adulthood. And like their uninfected peers, they're exploring sexuality, they're learning about relationships, and they're very interested in where they fit in the world. And they're needing to make lots of important decisions as they become sexually active about their reproductive choices. But unlike their uninfected peers, they have some other challenges. Those challenges are rather significant and not always the first thing that they're thinking about, but the concerns of those in the public health arena as we think about them moving into adulthood. We're concerned and they've become concerned about their ability to have relationships with partners and worrying about acquiring sexually transmitted infections, which for them as HIV positive young women might be more risky. They're concerned about spreading HIV infection to their sexual partners through unprotected sex. And most importantly, and what I'll be speaking to you today about, is about pregnancy and the risk of mother-to-child transmission. So in the cohort of children we followed, we started to see a frequent occurrence of pregnancies and we started wondering about what was going on with these young women and what we could do in order to help support them in having healthy pregnancies if that was their choice. So we wanted to understand the reproductive decision making process that these young women were thinking about as they entered adolescence and see if there was anything that possibly predicted the reproductive choices within this cohort. So I'm going to be talking about the program at the University of Maryland, which is about an hour north without traffic of where we are today. Um, we have a pretty comprehensive program that involves both a pediatric program, which provides specialty HIV care, as well as health maintenance care to HIV positive infants, children, and youth. We're also integrated with a high-risk OB program so that we're able to follow the young women with the same team as they move through if they choose to become pregnant and have babies through that program. And we also have a program where we follow their infants and we're able to provide special care for those infants as well. So our cohort, we decided to capture all of the girls within our cohort who were between the ages of 12 and 27 um, who received their HIV primary care from our program between July of 2003 and May of 2012. And we looked at that age interval because that was when it seemed that we were getting more reports of sexual activity amongst the young girls, so we started at 12. And we used our electronic database um, to review and abstract information about the young women, including demographic variables, their show rate for clinic appointments, their viral load both during their pre-pregnancy and prenatal visits. We looked at disclosure to partners that's recorded in the record so that we can avoid inadvertent disclosures during care, and whether the girls had talked about an intention to become pregnant. And we analyzed the data using STATA 11. So I'm going to first talk about the whole cohort of girls um, that we were looking at for this small retrospective chart review study. And there were 88 perinatally infected adolescent females between the ages of 12 and 27 who we reviewed. Um, they were predominantly urban, living at or below the poverty level. 87% self-reported as African American, and you can see the distribution of their ages. Um, the educational level attained is sort of reflective of their age. So many of them, about 24%, had received less than high school education because they weren't quite old enough to get to high school. And 24% have at least started or have completed some part of college. So now I'm going to talk more about the subset of girls who have become pregnant. Within this cohort, 29 girls have been pregnant at least, at least once. 10 girls had been pregnant at least once, if not twice or more. And you see the range, and it's sort of deceiving because one girl who was pregnant eight times actually had three live births and five miscarriages. So the rest of the girls, the most, were two pregnancies, so one or two. 
So we saw a total of 47 pregnancies within this cohort of 88 girls, resulting in 24 live births with one set of twins, nine terminations, nine miscarriages, and as the time when I wrote these slides, we had five girls that were currently pregnant, but one delivered last night, but she will not be included in the analysis. The mean age at first pregnancy was 19 years and two months, with a range of 16 years, three to 22 years. And the mean age at the second pregnancy was 20 years, with a range between 17.8 and 24.7. Only four of the girls reported planning a pregnancy. 18 of the girls, or 37%, had disclosed to their partner at the time of their pregnancy. But that number goes up, and by the time of delivery, for those 24 live births, 18 girls had disclosed to their partner within that process. The mode of delivery for live births, we had 13 spontaneous vaginal deliveries and 12 C-sections, only five of which were due to high viral load at delivery. So here are some of our findings. Um, first, we wanted to look at adherence to their prenatal appointments and see if there was any change from their um, pre-pregnancy data. So what we looked at was their, their attendance at clinic rate for the year leading up to their pregnancy. And there, the average or the mean rate of attendance at the clinic was about 61.6%, which was pretty much reflective of our whole clinic population. But when we took a look at their prenatal visits, we looked at each of their prenatal visits within our OB program, it went up to 73.7%, which is a significant improvement in adherence to clinic appointments at 0 .001. We also were very interested in looking at their viral load during pregnancy. We started by looking at the two viral loads closest to their, diagnose, to their pregnancy diagnosis, and at that time, the mean was 15, 1,766. During prenatal care, we looked at their first OB appointment and their last OB appointment before delivery. The viral load mean was 4,062, with a range of non-detectable to 47,000. And three quarters of the girls were non-detectable at delivery, which showed a significant improvement in viral suppression of 0.009. One of the things that when we were anecdotally talking about these issues in the clinic and about looking at the girls and trying to understand what may or may not be predicting high rates of pregnancy amongst our cohort, we became interested in one of the factors being early maternal loss, whether the young women who were pregnant had lost their mothers at a young age. Um, while none of these findings are significant, and I think that's because our N is small, I think that there's some important information here that we can talk about. The two bar graphs to the left reflect those with a living mother who are, if you look at the first, I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the first bar, those are girls who are pregnant. The blue line are mothers who are alive, and the red line are mothers who are deceased. And then to the right are girls who are never pregnant, and again, the blue line is the mothers who are alive and the mothers who are deceased. While that difference is, not, difference is not significant, it's trending towards significance with girls who get pregnant are more likely to have a deceased mother. The second bullet point doesn't have a line on there on the bar graph, but when we looked at the subset of girls, so those, those two are all girls who have become pregnant. When we looked at those girls who had a live birth, mothers, girls who were had a living mother were less likely to have a live birth than those with a deceased mother. But again, the results, while not significant, we felt if the N was larger, that would probably be a trend that would prove to be significant. Finally, while we don't have enough data to do any statistical analysis, I was looking at the girls who terminated. And of the nine girls who terminated, eight had a deceased mother and one had a living mother. So I'm going to briefly review some of our outcomes. The first is the really good news. All babies born to the perinatally infected girls in our program have been HIV negative. All but one infant was full term with a mean gestational age at delivery of 38.3 weeks. 86.3% of women kept their first postpartum visit. 19 out of the 25 fathers were involved with the baby at infant follow-up. Now, we asked the girls at their first, first postnatal appointment about postnatal contraception plans. Eight of the girls reported that they were choosing Depo, and three girls were reporting to be using condoms with some other form of birth control. 
but our rates of birth control are low. What we've been able to conclude so far is that prevention of mother-to-child transmission in this cohort of girls works, and that's really good news. And we believe that our comprehensive program providing support throughout the girls' pregnancy with people from the same team was also a great support. But we also don't think that we want to recommend that adherence, to get good adherence from adolescents, you want to suggest that they should become pregnant. So we started to think about what is going on and what might help to explain that. And one thing that I've been thinking and we sort of look at is that for those of us who work with adolescents and adherence, it's very hard for them to form short-term goals and to think about specific ways to get them to why the adherence might matter. And we realize that it's likely that for these young women that knowing the impact of their adherence on the baby was enough to sort of support them and improve their adherence during pregnancy. And I think that as we talk about implications and interventions that we might want to think about other ways besides pregnancy that we could find goals and targets for these young women so that they might feel more successful and be able to use adherence strategies a little bit more successfully. Some of the challenges, obviously, the low rate of condom use is a problem in our population, as well as disclosure of HIV status to partners. And we recognize that for all young women, disclosure to partners, sexual partners, is challenging. But for this younger group of women who feel particularly vulnerable and have often just been disclosed of their own status in the last five to ten years, this is a much more challenging issue and so something that we feel needs more attention and support. So we think that the directions we should focus on, qualitative studies to understand what are the reproductive decision-making processes for perinatally infected girls, and not to leave out the dads. So we really should explore the experiences of boys who become fathers. I also believe that our data is pretty compelling and that we really should start to examine the role of maternal, early maternal loss in childbearing beliefs and behavior in this cohort of youth. And I think at this time, we have the opportunity to create multi-site and international studies to prospectively monitor perinatally infected girls to understand their needs as they age into adolescence. I wanted to thank the adolescents whose stories we're sharing today and the many members, some of whom are here today, of our multidisciplinary